My talk today is going to be on the medical and social side effects of contraception uh, and why I became an NFP only OBGYN uh, in today's society. So the objectives of this is to kind of tell my story. How did I get here and what brought me here? Discuss some of the uh, more common side effects of contraception that we see and discuss the social consequences of contraception. But most importantly, why did I choose natural family planning as the way to run my practice? This is not an argument about you know, the use of contraception in some morally acceptable ways. There are some uh, times when oral contraceptives, or what I call combined hormonal agents, can be used in a morally acceptable way due to an ethical principle called the rule of double effect. And that rule of double effect states that if the intended purpose is not for contraception, but to treat a medical condition or a medical disorder, it can be morally illicit if a secondary outcome happens to be uh, infertility or an inability to conceive. That we cannot act with the intention of doing an evil to get a good. Uh, we must be acting in the good and avoiding evil. Uh, there are also some medically proven benefits of combined, oral, uh, combined hormonal agents or oral contraception and the reduction of certain types of cancers. Uh, but many times those can be managed without contraceptive agents and are not always necessary. And long term, the debate is whether they actually reduce the overall incidences of certain types of these certain types of cancers or just while the woman is taking the agents. So to start off, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. As you heard Mike say, I, I grew up in a Catholic family, cradle Catholic. I'd always considered myself to be pro-life, but at times I never really understood what it meant to be pro-life. I was very much involved in the secular world. Uh, and in fact, I was very, very far away from the church. At that time, you know, I really felt that it wasn't my place or my point in life to tell you what to do. It was up to you to decide how you wanted to live your life and that my beliefs shouldn't necessarily influence you. And I also, there was also the pervasive uh, notion that suffering should be avoided at all costs. And so we oftentimes engaged in contraception with the notion that we are going to help avoid unwanted pregnancies and to help overcome poverty and to help overcome the sexual abuse and everything else that was going on in female health care. Well, what I didn't realize is that I was just chasing after the almighty dollar. Uh, my, my, my allegiances were not to God. My allegiances were with the secular society and uh, 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 looking for that uh, monetary gain and uh, uh, some of the other things that we find uh, in today's culture. About 1999, I had become the target of a Raymond Christian group. Uh, to evangelize me with regards to becoming a pro-life NFP only physician. I knew absolutely, I, I knew the common strain that, that we were taught in obstetrics and gynecology residencies that uh, natural family planning was for parents. Uh, people who were going to have large families who were not going to be able to control their fertility and that uh, it didn't work. It had, it had no uh, benefit in that respect. In fact, we didn't recommend it to anybody. And what happened was I started to see a group of patients who were practicing natural family planning. And these patients were in stark contrast to the patients that I was seeing who were using contraception. There seemed to be something different about them. They had a different way of interacting with each other. They had a different level of happiness. Their children were often present with them. The children were well behaved, they were attentive, they listened to what the parents said. But whenever we were talking in, in, in the office or in an examination room, the husband and the wives always had a respectful look for each other, uh, going back and forth and helping each other out in those moments. And I thought, geez, why is this? Why, why are they so different from the people who are contraceptive? But they, you know, they gave me, they evangelized me through giving me material. People oftentimes ask me, how do I evangelize a doctor to become either natural family planning only or uh, to become more pro-life? And it's, it's not necessarily through nagging them or anything. It's just providing them with materials. And I had accumulated a stack of materials that were about this high on my back desk that were getting in the way of all my charts. And so I figured at one point I'd better take them home. And eventually I started reading them. But what really uh, started this conversion down the road was working with a couple who had infertility. They were in their late 30s. 
uh, a Catholic family. I knew they were Catholic. Uh, very, very nice. Uh, very uh, successful executives within the Columbus community. And we had finally gotten to the point where we had exhausted all uh, treatments of fertility that I felt I could provide to them. And we had gone pretty far, probably a little bit farther than I felt comfortable at time. And I said to them, I said, the next step for you is to go on to see a fertility specialist. And they looked at me and said, well, we, we're not going to do that. And I said to them, why not? And they said, well, we're Catholic. We don't believe in in vitro fertilization or any of those other things. I said, well, I'm Catholic too. I don't see anything wrong with it. Lots of my patients are Catholic and they go off and get IVF, all these other things. But they were warning me about the negative aspects of what could happen with in vitro fertilization and some of the reproductive technologies that we see today. And they gave me an article that introduced me to this man. This is Dr. Thomas Hilgers, uh, who is the founder of the Pope Paul VI Institute for the Study of Human Reproduction in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And the, the article was about treating infertility through natural approaches, through natural family planning. And I was interested in it a little bit uh, because I'd seen all these other patients who were using natural family planning, and I wanted to know what this guy had to say about it. But one of the things you had to do to enroll in this class was you had to say, I'm not using contraception, I won't prescribe contraception, I won't do sterilizations, I will follow the Catholic Church's teachings on this. I said, oh, wait a minute here, time out. I'm not doing all this stuff. My lifestyle, my living, everything that I do depends on me prescribing contraception and doing these other things. At one point in time, I did the most number of sterilizations in the city of Columbus in one year. So I went and I audited the course and, and learned about the, the Creighton Model Fertility Care System uh, at that time. Well, it just so happens that while I was there, there was this very diminutive nun uh, whose order actually taught me grade school. I think God has a funny way of introducing you to your future through what you get. I, I mean, if, if you look at my, my name is Michael, of course. Um, my, my confirmation name is Augustine. And I truly was an Augustine, to, to speak, in, in my conversion back to the faith. But this nun, Sister uh, Renee Merkins, at that time was giving a talk on Humanae Vitae. And I was sitting in the back of the room uh, and just listening to this. And I, I'd never ever heard of Humanae Vitae before. And I just felt this rush come down the center aisle and smack me in the forehead saying, you're doing it all wrong. You're doing it all wrong. But it was, the, the news of Humanae Vitae was so shocking to me. It was a complete and total paradigm shift about the relationship between man and woman. It was telling me that the marital act was not what I'd always thought it was to be. The marital act was merely two people who loved each other, who got together, who had babies when they chose to, and lived for each other's well-being just to have whatever they wanted, you know, so that they had constant companionship, so they could go to Florida and the Bahamas and everywhere else with somebody really nice standing next to them, right? Um, but that's not what it was all about. The, the marital act was something totally and completely different, being fully human, being a total and complete sacrifice of each other, and, and it was faithful. There was no room for infidelity, there was no room for other people, but most of all, it was fruitful, okay? And it, and it was, it was the, really the one that hit me the most was that it was total and complete. When we give ourselves at the altar to the Mass, it's a total and complete giving of ourselves in every aspect of ourselves, including our fertility. It also told me that the marital act was part of God's design. And this is something that, they, that contraception will tell you is, is not necessarily true. We can separate the, the marital act from the, the, the procreation of children. Well, no, they can't. No, they can't. It's, it's an inviolable law of nature that intercourse is intended to be a bonding moment as well as a moment for producing and creating new life. It's part of God's plan. And that's what natural law is, it's God's plan. That's why no matter how hard we try, there will always be uh, pregnancies related to contraception. So when I came home from this, I decided I was no longer gonna do any tubal ligation because the Catholic Church teaches us it is our duty to defend the integrity of our human bodies. I was also not gonna do IUDs. And I finally came to realize after I had one patient come in with an IUD in place after she became pregnant, and I started to do some research on it. 
With IUDs, if they're left in place, they're going to cause problems with the pregnancy, or they may cause problems with the pregnancy. But if I remove it, there's a 50% chance that that pregnancy may be lost to miscarriage. Well, to me, that's a direct effect on the infant that's being developed in the uterus. The question that I had is, what do I do about the pill? Probably 80, 90% of my patients were there on the wall kind of such a pill. It was just the way things were at that time. And I had some fear. I had some real fear when you're living in that secular world about what's going to happen to my income, what's going to be happening to the life that my wife and I thought that we were going to be living, what's going to happen to all of those things. I finally came to realize several things. One, contraception and abortion are elective. Fertility is not a disease. It's one of the only, in fact it is the only medication that is given to treat a normal physiologic process in a woman's body and in a male's body. Okay. And that pregnancy is not inevitable. We do not have to become pregnant. It is not inevitable that if a woman is dating a man, they have to have sex to become pregnant. That too, in some respects, is elective. We make a choice. And we make that choice before we decide to engage in the marital act. And that the marital act, finally, is meant to be shared within marriage. So let's talk about some contraceptive facts as we move forward. There's about 62 million women in the United States who are in their childbearing years. And a typical US woman now only wants two children. So she's going to spend a lot of her time uh, during, uh, during that phase uh, being sexually active and not wanting children and they're going to want some way to avoid having children. The most common uh, methods used are non-permanent methods of, of, of contraception. If they're less than 30 years old, the pill is the leading method. If they're greater than 30 years old, then sterilization is the method. Uh, blacks and Hispanics uh, choose sterilization more frequently. I think this is mostly due to coercion. If you have ever, you're not intimately involved in resident training, but when, I was, when I'm working with residents or I'm involved in, in clinics, what we see is if a patient comes in, she's over the age of 21, and she's had more than three or four children, the first question is, what do you want to do about your uh, contraception after this baby, and do you want your tubes tied? I really don't think you need to have more children. So I think it's really, it's a coercive effort uh, for some of the underserved uh, to do that, because when you look at this, the most common things for whites is pills. So what are some of the medical consequences of contraception? Probably the one that uh, receives a lot of controversy, but with a new article that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, from a Danish study. Uh, if anybody, if you know anything about, if you see any articles in medicine that are on the Danish study, the Danish have the most extensive medical records of any other nation. Everyone, when they're from the time they're born, is enrolled in the Danish health network, okay? And they're given a unique identifier. And so they're able to follow these people throughout their whole lives and have a fairly a good idea of what's going on with them, what medications they've used, everything else. What they saw was they saw 1.2 times increased risk of uh, breast cancer in all women using oral contraception. That's a 20% higher risk of, of breast cancer. Other studies have shown that there's increased risk of high, type, high risk types of breast cancer, including what we call the triple negative, which means that the estrogen receptors, the progesterone receptors, and the HER2 mu receptors are, are, are not there, and that is very difficult to treat. If a woman stops using oral contraception, the risk remains if she used it for five years or more. There still is an increased risk for breast cancer that they saw with the uh, use of a progestin-only IUD which is about 21% increased risk. With cervical cancer, uh, what we see is that uh, oral contraceptives are more of a promoter of uh, uh, HPV's oncogenic effect. If they've been using the uh, uh, oral contraceptive pills for, for greater than nine years of use, a woman who is positive for the human papillomavirus will have almost a three to six times uh, increased risk uh, for developing cervical cancer. If they've been using it for more than 10 years, they'll have a risk of almost four times uh, someone who is not. 
Um, it does not uh, increase the acquisition or the persistence of the disease, uh, and uh, there's no residual effect once they're off the pills for more than 10 years. HPV, you know, is, is uh, something that uh, came on the rise after we saw uh, the introduction of contraception, but now there are the HPV vaccinations uh, that are present, and so there should be some decline in the incidences of cervical cancers as we move forward if more people are vaccinated for the HPV vaccine. When we look at blood clots, we see that depending on the type of contraceptive used, there's a significantly increased risk of blood clots forming. There's other cardiovascular risks that are out there also. In my time uh, that I was prescribing contraception, I had four women who are less than 40 years of old, 40 years of age, who have heart attacks. Uh, and when asked uh, what the inciting event was, the doctor said they didn't know, but the only thing that I could find in their record was that they're on oral contraceptive agents. And typically, those heart attacks are due to thrombotic events with some other type of cardiac abnormality. We also had one, uh, two women who had a stroke, and one of my dear friends lost vision in her right eye due to a thrombotic event to her retinal artery in her, in her eye. Depression. Um, this is something that is real, and I think we need to take more seriously, uh, especially with the increased rates of suicide that we're seeing, especially among our young people. And a lot of it depended on the type of uh, pills that they were used, using. But when we look at the uh, adolescents and youth and data that we see, um, there have, and this, so, so going back to that last slide, the increased risk of about 20% of depression amongst teenagers or first time use of uh, antidepressants among teenagers. We also see that oral contraceptives also increase the number of suicide attempts and su successful suicides in women who are using oral contraceptive pills. What uh, this study was done uh, by the National Study of Family uh, Group uh, data. This is a, a government data group. What they found is that all you, if you are ever a user of oral contraceptives during your teenage years or your adolescent years, you had a higher risk of having sex, of having a sexually transmitted disease or pelvic inflammatory disease, unintended pregnancy, abortion, more sexual partners, and early age of sexual uh, debut by about two years. The average age for those who are on oral contraceptives is around 16 and around those was 18. What they found was that uh, religiosity, uh, how faithful they were to their religion, regular church attendance, and intact family were protective against these things. And when we get into the social side effects, we'll see how important that really is and the effect that contraception has had on those types of things. And let's talk about the social impact of contraception. And one of the things that I say, uh, especially when I'm talking to Catholic communities, is the contracept contraceptives are the perfect agent for the devil. And why do I say that? Let's go back to Genesis. When God says to Mary, I will put enmity, or says to Eve, I will put enmity between you and your offspring. Okay? Uh, and so it's our, the offspring of the woman, namely Jesus Christ and, and, and Mary, but our, our offspring who will be fighting against the devil. Okay? What's the greatest way to decrease the army? Don't produce offspring. So if we decrease the amount of offspring, or if we feel that we are in control of our, of our natural capabilities, the devil is winning. The devil puts that forth. So Humanity Vitae made several predictions. That marital infidelity, and there would be a general lowering of moral standards, that there would be objectification of women, and that the government control of contraception would occur. I think the last two are very easy to see. All you have to do is turn on the television, look at a newspaper article or an ad or anything else like that, and you can see the objectification of women. But now it's also the objectification of men, you know, uh, and children, you know, teenagers, young teenagers. So what really, I, I had to ask, well, what, you know, we, we think that contraception would be good for marriage, it would be good for family, it would be good for everything else. Well, all we have to do is turn to some economists to answer this. And the first article I'd like to talk about is one called The End of Shotgun Marriage. And if you notice the second name there, Yellen, it may sound familiar, that's the same Janet Yellen who was the head of the Fed for a number of years. And she and her husband, Akerloff, wrote this article 
on out of wedlock pregnancies. And what they talk about is that in 1963, with the, with the introduction of the birth control pill, and in 1973, with the legalization of abortion, we had this technology shock. And it was expected that this uh, liberalization of policy would lead to fewer out of wedlock pregnancies, but in fact, the opposite happened. And what we see is that in 1965, the number of uh, out of wedlock pregnancies to blacks was around 24%, and to whites it was around 3.1%. By 1990, that had risen to approximately 64% for blacks and about 18% for whites. And they remarked that there was no relationship to the social welfare status. The, you know, the conservatives will try to tell you that it's related to uh, increase in payments to social welfare status. They don't need to have uh, their husbands around to help support the people or anything else like that. They have as many children as they want. The, the, the more liberal or the left-leaning people will tell you uh, it's, it's because there's not enough access to contraception or abortion that these things will happen. But before 1970, if you were in a relationship with a man, you did not necessarily become sexually active because there was always this stigma about being an unwed mother, and few women were willing to engage in sexual activity uh, and to bear children outside of marriage. And so they went into this relationship with the promise that if we became pregnant, you're going to marry me. Men, they were willing to keep that promise uh, because they knew that in leaving one woman, they would be more likely to face the same situation with another woman. And so if they had found a woman that they felt was uh, compatible with them, uh, that's what they would, would stick with. And what we can see in this slide is if you, the red line, but the red line is the introduction of contraception. What most people don't realize is that oral contraceptive agents were actually introduced in 1958, but they were only legally to be used for treatment of menstrual disorders. In 1963 is when they were liberalized for use of all things. And we can see the rise, and this is worldwide in some of the English-speaking countries, where we see the rise in unwed pregnancies after the introduction of the oral contraceptive pills and its other uh, uh, techniques of contraception. And as we saw the increased availability of contraception and abortion, what we saw is that women who were willing to get abortion or were reliable users of contraception uh, no longer requested the condition of marriage. If you are not a reliable user or you were not willing to get an abortion, you were pressured to participate because now you had competition for your partner. There was no, they, they now feared losing that partner. And we're going to, this will come out more in the next article I talked about. We also saw that premarital sex became the norm, and many of the sexual taboos that had typically been out there before were gone. And so uh, it became a choice of the woman of what she was, what she was going to do. So we see that as a, a lowering of the general moral standards that are there. Prior to the sexual revolution, in, in, in the introduction of the technologies, women may have had less freedom but they could get from men what was expected, and that was responsibility for their welfare. Today, women are more free, and they have the right of choice, but men have also afforded themselves that same choice, in that men have made the choice that, well, if it's her choice of whether to keep this child or not, then it's my choice of whether I'm going to take responsibility for this child or not, and be there to help raise this child and provide financial support. And then, so what we also see is that before 1970s, unmarried mothers kept very few of their babies. You know, the, the, they would be scurried away, they would be sent to live at an aunt's house or somewhere else to have the baby, they'd go to the homes for unwed mothers. There was a number of different things that happened prior to the legalization of abortion and the introduction of contraception. But typically, they would go and those babies would be placed for adoption. After the introduction of contraception and legalization of abortion nationwide, and the, the decline in the moral standards there that lost the stigma of unwed motherhood, we see a decline in the number of adoptions that were present. Okay. Um, and so uh, that was a negative impact on society as a whole. 
In the old days of the 1950s, 60s, and 40, you know, the earlier days, they pregnant teenagers, uh, you know, like I said, would be banished from from all these things. Now that stigma is gone, and so these children are there. The next article I want to talk about is by, is by a, an economist by the name of Tim Riker, brilliant, and brilliant man. Um, what he says is that contraception in this article has, uh, is, is socially damaging, that it's sexist, okay, that it, uh, it shows a massive redistribution of wealth and power away from women and to, and to men, and it creates what's called, similar to what we saw with uh, Yellen and Akerlof's article, a prisoner's dilemma. And what he talks about is he breaks, the, he now sees that prior to the introduction of contraception and abortion, there was basically a mating market that had an equal number of men and women. This is, you know, when our grandparents and our parents were married, there was this market where you, you, you met everybody and you, you kind of decided who you liked, who you didn't like, you courted for a while, and then you finally decided, yeah, I really like this one, this is who we're going to be getting married. But when you introduce contraception and abortion, it lowers that cost for premarital engagement and sexual activity below the price level of uh, necessary to separate the markets. So he creates two markets. There becomes a market for sex, and there becomes a market for marriage. Because men and women have different reproductive capabilities, men can reproduce at any time, and they can pretty much reproduce throughout their life. Um, everybody remember Tony Randall from the Odd Couple? Some of you young people may not. Tony Randall was having kids in his 80s. Okay. But, uh, you know, men can reproduce, but women can't. Women can typically reproduce in their younger ages, in their 20s and 30s, okay? And so they tend to leave the sex market earlier than the men, and the men tend to stay in the sex market longer. So this creates an imbalance of the number of men and women in each market. Well, anytime you're the scarce commodity, you have a greater price, you know? It's like that bottle of Pappy Van Winkle bourbon, if anybody finds bourbon, you know? You can't find it anywhere, so it demands a price of $1,900. But if you want to go buy a bottle of Jack Daniels, you can get it for seven bucks here or there. There's a high supply of that, there's a lower supply of the other ones. It changes the price. So in the sex market, women have a higher price, they can demand a higher price, they can demand more from the man. They can demand fidelity, they can demand responsibility, they can demand they do these that certain things for them, treat them nice in that. In the marriage market, however, women are in the surplus, men are in the uh, they're very, they're scarce. And so the men can demand a higher price, and what we see is that women can make bad choices. Men invest very little to produce, women invest everything. I look at it as the chicken versus the pig situation, if you know that joke. And a, a, a chicken says to a pig, hey, let's go make a ham and egg, let's go make a ham and egg breakfast for the farmer. You know, well for the, for the chicken, that's just a contribution for the pig, it's a sacrifice. Um, the pig's got to give itself up. Well, the lower regulative bargaining power of women actually builds in for divorce. And they, they get into marriage knowing that they need a way out. They don't go into marriage with a full commitment. They go in saying, well, if it doesn't work out, I've got divorce. And so the relative bargaining that they have, they make these bad deals, uh, but now they're able to say, I want divorce. And if we look at a graph of the introduction of contraception in the 1960s, and we compare that graph to the widespread use of contraception, we see that once we introduce contraception, divorce parallels that line until we hit an equilibrium. And this is uh, where uh, Dr. Reichert says eventually it's going to increase to meet the demands and the needs of the people until they reach an equilibrium. Because women need their heads, their bet against uh, uh, divorce, they, 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 um, childbearing has a negative impact on what they can do. So women, to hedge their bet against divorce, what did they do? They typically relied, prior to contraception, they relied on the husband to provide an income for the family and to provide the support for the children. So with the introduction of contraception and some of the other social changes that have happened, they entered the workforce. That's not a bad thing that women entered the workforce, and they developed into different careers that hadn't been open to them before, including uh, law degrees and medical degrees. In fact, more than 50% of all medical school applicants this year and in the years past have been female. 
So there was some good that this, this opened up the market to them, but it was because there was this added pressure to have monetary support of yourself should you get into a relationship that wasn't going to work out and be bad. So women can, can, uh, can go and make these investments in their well-being to get these jobs and these careers and everything else, but what happens if they become pregnant? Well, now they've got all this time, all this money, all this energy invested in their careers, and now they're pregnant and they don't have a commitment from the man. So now this is where abortion comes into play. When they make uh, abortion and contraception serve as mutual insurance policies against divorce and give the woman increased bargaining power that she has lost in the marriage markets. And as we saw in the Akerlof and Yellen article, um, they no longer have to have shotgun wedding, but rather there's a loss in investment of their capital. And so uh, as contraception use increases, as abortion increases also, as, as does the divorce rate. Uh, and it does increase until equilibrium is reached, after which abortion rates remain fairly constant. And this is a graph, again, showing abortion rates with the rise of contraception, and they basically parallel each other. In some critical respects, abortion is the same choice as the decision to use contraception. This is from uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. This is where the Supreme Court solidified that we must have abortion as a response to contraception. Uh, they've had two decades of social uh, development with people going into the sex market and, and making choices that define the views of themselves and their place in society. They must have abortion in the event that contraception should fail. Contraception also eliminates the possibility of being detected in infidelity, not only for men, but for the women. And because the typical way that you are detected is the woman became pregnant and had a child. Now it's more through the acquisition of sexually transmitted infection. But with the, uh, those can even be uh, avoided now. And so it makes it easier for uh, the husband or the wife to dip into the sex market when they want to. If things aren't going well, well, I'll just go see what I can get over here. Or if the wife is going through difficult times and not wanting to engage in a marital relationship, uh, then she may move forward from there. One of the final economic impacts is that when we look at limited supplies of limited goods, such as housing, luxury items, those types of things, because women have entered the market, all of these things are now priced at two income earner home, two, um, two income earner prices. And so it makes it more difficult for a young family who wants to have one spouse, I'm not saying it has to be the wife anymore, to stay at home and to raise the children. It becomes more expensive because now houses, cars, uh, groceries, everything else are priced at two income earners. Unfortunately, women bear the cost for this, and it's reflected in overall decrease in female happiness over time. Finally, the prisoner's dilemma. Um, you can read this while I talk if you want. It's, this is uh, Calvin Howes, one of my favorite cartoons of all time. This occurs in situations when all parties have a choice between cooperation and non-cooperation. Uh, and all parties would be better off if they cooperated. Uh, however, cooperation cannot be effectively coordinated or enforced in these situations if each party chooses the best choice that's good for them on an individual basis. Prime example of this is fishing. Uh, you want to maintain a fishery, you don't want to overfish it, you want to do everything right to keep that ecosystem in place. Everybody agrees we're not going to fish more than this. Well, one guy decides he's going to go out and fish more, so he gets a greater profit. He gets the edge of it. Now, everybody sees he's kind of cheating, and if he can get away with it, then we can get away with it. And so the mutual uh, uh, outcome is, for best individuals, is non-cooperation. For women, the choice, between, the choice is between contraception and non-contraception. Those who choose to, be con to contracept become the scarce resources, and like I said, able to demand the higher prices. But those who choose not to receive no benefit from the higher prices in that sex market and suffer reduced gains in the marriage market. So overall, the benefit to these relationships is negative for them. So the pressure is on them to enter into the sex market at an earlier age and before they wanted to uh, so that they can get some of those gains that they are losing in marriage offset by uh, the gains they make in the other market, which eventually leads to the outcomes that we talked about. Increased needs for divorce, increased risk for abortion, increased in unwed wedlock and out of uh, 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 single parent homes, 
Uh, dynamic changes to the mating relationships, um, lower rates of adoption, and typically bad outcomes for women. When we look at violent death, there was an article that came out in the British Medical Journal that they said there was a 1.9 to almost two times significantly higher rate of violent deaths for women who used oral contraceptives. They couldn't necessarily explain it. Oral contraceptives in this article, they're actually looking at overall mortality in, uh, of those people who use contraception. Uh, and they re reported convincing evidence for re reduction in mortality from certain types of cancers and other diseases in women who use contraception, but they also discovered a higher rate of violent death. And this increase, this rate increased with longer duration of use. And they don't really give an explanation for this. Well, we can see from this slide the increase in violent rates, violent uh, crimes. This is overall, not necessarily against women, but overall, the introduction since 1963 and the rise in violent crime rates. Can't say it's causal. Can't say it's necessarily uh, directly because of contraception, but it's just interesting to look at to see what happens from that time when it's introduced. So one of the reasons that we think that, uh, that there may be increased aggression against women is pheromones and mate preferences. Pheromones are chemicals that are produced in our sweat glands and in our body that attract a, a mate, okay? Uh, and they are a part, again, of God's natural law. In our bodies, we have these proteins that are on our cells called the human uh, lymphocyte HLA antigens, okay? I'm not gonna try to get into that. And um, these help define who we are, what cell, caught up in this picture. It tells us we're cell. These are very important when you're getting a transplant. So if you're getting a liver transplant or a kidney transplant or heart transplant or anything, they look at these proteins and they try to find somebody who's almost a direct match to you or as close a match to you so you will reject less of that, of that organ that you're getting. And one of the hypotheses of the increase in violence is that uh, the changes in the partner preference that are created by the use of oral contraceptives that suppress the ovulatory function of the woman such that users of oral contraceptives prefer men who are similar to them with these histocompatibility complexes. Um, and it may express itself in lower sexual responsivity to the long-term partner because it's like having sex with your brother because you're almost the same. Um, and, all, and this is after they stop using oral contraceptives. But they may also reject sexual advances more frequently, have more affairs, and experience having problems, having children, and having less healthy children because there's less genetic diversity. The effect of pheromones can be demonstrated in two articles, but there are multiple articles out there. The first is a colony of macaque monkeys that was set up on the Bahama Islands. And what they did is they had a dominant male, multiple females, multiple less dominant males, and they observed them for three months. And after three months, they injected five of the, uh, the females with Depo-Provera a three month long acting contraception. And what, they, uh, these, the, and what they saw was that the alpha male stopped having sex with them and replaced the women who had, the, the females that had been injected with two hormone free females uh, for sexual episodes. So they took it after three months that, that Depo Provera wore off, they injected the other females who hadn't been injected before and they saw similar results. He went back to having uh, intercourse with the other three. Then, then they did the best experiment of all. They injected all the female first. And what this caused was this caused the male to kind of become confused and agitated. He attempted rape uh, on some of them and behaved in turbulent manners. Once those effects wore off after three months, normal behavior returned. Now, we can't say this is applicable to humans, but apes are one of the closest relatives we have in the phylogenetic tree. Um, but it, it may explain why some women say, I started on the pill because I started having sex. Now I'm, on, uh, now I'm on, the, on the pill and I'm not having sex. The other study was what's called a t-shirt sniff test. And what they did is they took male and female students in college who were extremely different with these proteins on their cells, they're, they're the X opposite. The male students were asked to wear a t-shirt for two consecutive days and then put it into a plastic bag that window that they could smell through. Each female student was asked to rate the odors of the t-shirts that were there. And what they found is that they, the ones they scored higher were those males who had the greatest genetic uh, difference from them with regards to these antigens. Uh, and so that, uh, they, they found that the, these odors attracted you to people who had better genetic diversity. 
that greater genetic diversity means better survival for, uh, for our species. Healthier children, better to be able to withstand diseases and those types of things. Finally, the, one of the biggest things that we see in contraception is the attitudes toward the children. When we have a contraceptive view, we typically look at the uh, pregnancies as being unwanted or unintended, a choice or a blob of cells. When we look at it from a Catholic view or pro-life point of view, we look at it from a gift from God, a gift of human life, a sign of God's uh, love uh, and creation. So why did I choose to go with natural family planning? I did not feel that I was, I, I, I felt when I looked at everything, I, I had to be a man of science. I couldn't just go based on what my religion was telling me at that time. I had to, to, to go through all this process of looking at these, this information, this data, and processing it, everything else, and then looking at it within my own practice and seeing, was I doing the right thing for my patients? Was I doing the right thing? And I really did not feel that prescribing contraception or sterilization or those types of things, or even referring for abortion, which I never did, was the right thing for my patients. I always thought it had a negative impact. And so I chose natural family planning. It's not just for Catholics, and it has many advantages. One, there's no interference with the women's normal physiology. It requires no drugs or devices. It has no known physical side effects. It can be used at all stages of a reproductive life. It's cost effective, and once properly taught, couples do not uh, even need medical supervision. And it can be diagnostic. I use natural family planning as a diagnostic tool in the treatment of infertility patients. I saw patients from five different states. Uh, after I made my conversion. And we used natural family planning almost all of them. Many of them had already been through reproductive endocrinologists before and failed multiple trials of IVF. And we had about a 35% success rate with these women once we were able to treat them. I find it very odd that society tells women the only way you can be successful is if you take a little pill, put a little device in your uterus, or if you have your tubes tied. Why is that fair? Why do they have to be more like men to be successful? And I think you see this in the Me Too movement. This is the final outcome of what perception has done. By making women more sexually available, it led to the ability of sexual abuse, especially within the workplace, for gain within that market. And so they actually lost some of their bargaining power from that. It definitely improves communication about your sexuality and about your plans for life. I, I talked about helping subvertal couples, uh, and it enables a couple to be able to take control of their fertility. It's empowering to women. It's empowering for them to learn more about their body. It's empowering the husband to learn more about his wife, or his, his uh, and to be able to share in this, this uh, thing, and to see the beauty of God's creation. I always said, if you don't believe in God, study a woman's reproductive system. There's no way this was created by lightning striking a pool and a few amino acids coming together. Women can monitor their fertility, uh, and it's morally and culturally acceptable for people where they find uh, uh, artificial contraception unacceptable. We hear the term nowadays for comprehensive women's health care. That typically means sterilization, abortion, contraception. But if you truly want to say the word comprehensive women's health care, you must include some knowledge about natural family planning. I'm not saying that I'm going to convert anybody here to do what I do, and I'm not asking you to. That's a personal choice that you have to make. But when you look at some of the data, you have to think, I need to learn more about this. It's not fair for us to sit in our offices, have a woman come in with a chart using natural family planning and say, I don't know anything about this. It basically says to me, I skipped that class in physiology at medical school, because that's all that is. There are some disadvantages. Uh, it takes time to learn. And it does require some initial teaching. Uh, and there are, in the beginning, some fears of unplanned pregnancy, uh, especially in people who are coming off of contraception. And they, uh, that can be very real, and you just have to work with them more closely. But what it teaches the couple to do is how to sacrifice for each other, how to accept each other and to go forward and, and, and to overcome those things. It takes a high degree of motivation from both partners. Uh, and coming off of contraception, there's typically one partner who's less motivated than the other. And so we work through that. 
Um, and there may be difficulty usually natural uh, uh, family planning at certain times of life, especially coming off the oral contraceptive pills uh, and during the perimenopausal or premenopausal years. So when people say it's not effective, what they're typically talking about is grandma's rhythm method. I have to say grandma because I'm getting old. Um, but it's grandma's rhythm method. And it's not just the rhythm method anymore. This is something that has been studied extensively since the billing started looking at the ovulation method in 1959. What most people don't understand is that ovulation was first discovered by a Catholic priest in Germany. The basal body temperature chart was discovered by a Catholic priest in Germany who was looking for a way to help his young couples uh, avoid the frequent pregnancies that they were experiencing. So these are some of the success, the, 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 the rates of the common forms of contraception that we see. The perfect use is if you're in a laboratory setting and there's no room for air, uh, everything goes perfectly. The typical use is what happens when you introduce uh, human error or human reasoning or whatever else goes into it. Uh, and you can see that for the pill, the failure rate typically is around 6 to 9%. It's fairly high, uh, considering. The most common forms, are gonna, the most effective forms are going to be those that don't require necessarily any human uh, 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 thought or action during a time of intercourse. And that's going to be the intrauterine device, sterilization, um, uh, implants, uh, or patches, or rings. But when we put in some of the modern methods of natural planning, we can see that the typical use for those can be up there rivaling some of the more common forms of contraception, including the oral contraceptive pill. And this is based on uh, a number of different studies, and these studies have been done not only in uh, you know, affluent countries, but also in some poorer countries like India, where there's little nine taught people in Delhi how to use natural family planning. And so these can be applied so finally, um, artificial medical contraception remain the predominant choices to avoid pregnancy, even among Catholics. NFP, while it's safe, reliable, inexpensive, and morally acceptable, is largely underutilized. Um, and we still have to do a paradigm shift. Systematic NFP, or the regular use of the modern methods, has similar method and user effectiveness to the more popular forms of reversible contraception. I want to thank you all for inviting me down here to speak. I know what I say may be controversial to some, and it may be uh, appeasing to many of you. But this was my personal walk, my personal journey to where I came. And what I've experienced uh, in my own practice and in my own life has been nothing short of miraculous. When I left the world of contraception, I thought I was doomed. I thought that I would uh, be kicked out of my practice, that I would uh, not make a living, we'd have to sell our house, that we'd have to get rid of everything that we had. My practice eventually went down for about a six months period of time where I lost income, but it went back up by the grace of God. And what I saw in my practice was my practice went from being a destructive practice to a restorative practice. The majority of the things that I did prior to making the conversion was treating sexually transmitted diseases, office visits for contraception, special procedures looking for precancerous cells in the cervix, doing hysterectomies, doing uh, 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 biopsies of the cervix, a number of different, and uh, uh, in going in and, and rather than uh, conservatively treating endometriosis, removing organs. Afterwards, like I said, I became more of a restorative practice. We brought women who were having menstrual irregularities or other problems. Uh, we used natural family planning to help identify and target where they were having significant problems with their cycles. We targeted hormonal therapy to those particular points of their cycles so they could be restored back to a state of normal reproductive health, not only in just having normal health, but also in be becoming able to become pregnant. I became one of the top endometriosis surgeons in the city of Columbus, Ohio, um, and treated many people uh, during that time. And this time it was for more restorative purposes. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a great blessing. And, and many people will tell you you're named if you do it, but I'm, I'm an example of you will be blessed beyond your belief if you follow God's plan for human fertility. Thank you.
Currently, I work for one of the largest corporations that does that, and that's the, the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and, and I think how I've approached this from a, from a non-religious perspective is offering, uh, their, their, uh, is saying, you know, this is how I need to practice for me to do this. You can see that I have a large patient volume and patient base or whatever, but I can offer you a niche practice that's going to introduce more people to our healthcare system by having this available to them. And so you can look at it from that perspective. You can also look at it to what more procedures are you going to bring in here that are going to bring us money. In women's healthcare, you know, obstetrics is a loss loser. It's a loss leader, I'm sorry. Um, in that they don't make a lot of money off of pregnancy. Where they make money is through their mammograms, through the uh, surgeries, through the other procedures that are done. And women drive healthcare. They tell their husbands where they're going to go. They tell their husbands and children where they're going to go to. And so looking at it to you is not what you're losing, what are you gaining, okay? I'm, I brought, my hospital absolutely loved me. They hated it when I left. I had to leave for personal health reasons um, because I brought people into the market that normally would not be in their market. And we were doing a lot of laboratory testing. We were doing some x-ray studies. We were doing ultrasounds. I did a lot of surgery at that hospital. Uh, and uh, almost everybody who I helped to achieve pregnancy and almost all my obstetric patients came to those hospitals and then used their services for something else. So it's not what you're losing, it's what, what are you gaining. This is a positive event uh, in a life if someone decides to do it.